everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. This is really, really cool. Uh, I actually attended my first tech conference in this very room a couple years ago, so it's pretty cool to come back here and actually speak about stuff. Uh, so anyways, let's get going here. Uh, my name is Taylor Jones, uh, and this is a talk called Web Packing for the Journey Ahead. Uh, so before we start, real quick, I'm going to give you a quick introduction of me and who I am. Uh, I'm on the internet under Hi, I'm Taylor Jones, uh, often const uh, constantly misrecognized uh, as him Taylor Jones. It's Hi, I'm Taylor Jones. It's me trying to be smart and try to work on some hashtag branding for the world. But uh, if you want to see what I'm up to, uh, odds are I'm probably somewhere under that handle. Uh, I'm trying to figure this whole baby thing out. I'm about to have my first kid in a few months. I'm excited about that. Uh, I've got, thank you. <laughs> I got, uh, we got a dog that is spoiled rotten and I had no idea I was going to handle it. Got some cats too, but uh, I, my day job when I'm not hanging out with pets and stuff is to work at Isaiah, and we're in Orlando, Florida, um, and we're making cool stuff. We're also hiring, so if you want to uh, move to Orlando and write some cool Ruby code, uh, please come talk to me or hit me up on the internet. All right, so back to the talk here. Um, this whole thing, right, is based largely around a webpack. And webpack is pretty misunderstood because it's kind of a trendy thing that everybody's into these days. Uh, but more specifically, I want to talk about Webpack and Rails and the justification for why us as a community is even embracing it. And so for me, part of this talk was like just figuring out what the, what the kind of rationale for the rest of the community was, right? But it was also for understanding uh, why, it, why I'd want to pursue it personally as a developer. Um, so we'll ask how well they work together uh, and what, why would we actually want to bind them together? Because that's the purpose of the Webpacker gem is to uh, kind of bind Webpack and Rails together. Um, so if you're confused about Webpack, or you don't know about it, or you haven't looked up uh, the past couple minutes, uh, let's do a quick primer before we dive into the actual Rails stuff of it. Um, so Webpack is used as a means for bundling together modules of JavaScript code. Um, and it takes those bundles and optimizes them based on your preferences, and it takes the dependency-driven code and turns it into static assets so it can be better executed by the browser. Um, Rails developers have had this kind of stuff for a while with Asset Pipeline, which we're gonna talk about later, um, but for the JavaScript community, this is the bread and butter by which they actually optimize and deliver their assets. So the TLDR of Webpack is that it makes compiling and optimizing front-end code bases as a whole much easier. So I've have a crudely uh, keynoted graph together here about maybe how a flow of Webpack might work, where we take a front-end code base, we run it through Webpack, and we get static assets. Uh, another way to maybe look at this would be to say you have your abstract languages, and you're passing them through Webpack to get something that's more browser-oriented, right? So all these languages that are more abstract, I mean, JS is not an abstract language per se, but um, stuff like JSX and Handlebars, right, it's, it's an abstraction on top of those languages, and Webpack takes that and actually compiles it to JS, HTML, CSS, whatever might be needed. So the goal of this whole thing is generating code that's optimized for execution by the browser, as I mentioned before, and I'll probably mention it a few other times because it's a huge point of Webpack. So if anybody remembers back in the day when we had jQuery and then the jQuery.min.js, if you go to the website today, Right, you can probably, there's like 50 options that you can do to download uh, any kind of flavor or idea of jQuery. And it was uh, also implemented in stuff like Bootstrap. We have that in Bootstrap min.js or CSS or anything like that. So what I want to talk about is kind of the history of, of how we used to optimize code for the web, how web packers come into that, and uh, what exactly is going on, right? So we're taking, when we're making a library minified or putting dot min to it, we could totally just put dot min to the, to the end of like the library, right? Like I can just do nothing. There's no like standard of minification. But uh, a lot of times it's how developers would consider their libraries more optimized. Um, so I wanna kind of walk through what the minification process would look like. Uh, you can maybe remove spaces, right? Uh, you could say, hey, I've got this uh, JavaScript and I want to just remove all the spaces and have it be a one a giant one-liner. And so that way, like, a browser or anything that executes it doesn't have to look through those spaces. So it saves you a little bit of time, right? We could drop dependencies we don't use. Uh, so this is the example I was talking about with jQuery. It's like, all right, you got, a, you got an option to choose which version you want. 
Uh, but then you have all these checkboxes that you can say, oh, well, I only really want these selectors or these options or um, I'm back, uh, not to make myself feel old as a developer because I'm really not that, that old when it comes to that, but uh, you know, do I want jQuery UI? Do I want whatever library, right? And I think that's what made jQuery really, really useful. Um, you could preload external network dependencies or downloads. Uh, if you've ever worked with CDNs and kind of optimizing your delivery and not necessarily having a point of failure on like, hey, does this library CDN work or not, or how fast is it? Um, that's a way that we could optimize it if we kind of had those assets or those things ready for us. So the, the problem is, and it still kind of persists today, is that the, the difference in experience from these tools is way and totally different. Uh, meaning that some tools had these things and others didn't. Um, and Webpack has found popularity because it helps remedy that issue. Um, that's especially for the JavaScript community because as we look at uh, stuff like NPM and uh, Yarn, you have these insane amounts of dependencies and, and just these really deep graphs that really need to kind of maybe be optimized further past just a tool. So if there was a pitch I think that people would put on billboards for Webpack, it would be that's the one-stop shop for all your optimization needs. And it sounds kind of cheesy, and this is like literally the cheesiest photo I could find on the internet, but um, what it does have a point of is that it's pretty much the, just like a, hey, I have a, I have a JavaScript app that does module-based code or has like a lot of code that needs to be optimized, like let me just use this, and it's really just taken off as a solution. So um, Webpack has support for JavaScript out of the box, but um, what about the thousands and thousands of ever-growing languages that we are using uh, with JavaScript these days. Like, what do we actually do with that? So, Webpack Sure Utility is rooted within its ecosystem and uh, community of plugins that extends its reach just beyond JavaScript. Um, what this really reminds me of, and really is kind of getting to the meat of the talk, is it reminds me a lot of Ruby's gem ecosystem. You have this idea of a really well-supported, uh, well-adopted uh, tool or framework, and you have lots of people who are really great and bought into it, making some really awesome either plugins, gems, extensions to help take that framework to the next level, or to the next level, or to process. Uh, you know, maybe your use case of, of tooling, like say you use SAS, right? You're going to write a SAS gem. If you're a SAS if you write SAS CSS and you're a JavaScript developer, you're gonna say, hey, I wanna write a SAS Webpack plugin. So I'm talking about the difference between Ruby gems and Webpack plugins and how they're actually really, really similar. So again, another crudely drawn graph for your viewing pleasure, but um, you have the idea, right, of Rails and then the gem is just an extension that you append to it and then interpret as that SAS. And this is obviously a very open simplification of how a gem might work. But essentially, you're just taking that base set of code and you're adding something that helps interpret, compile, and deliver SAS. For Webpack, we have the same thing. Webpack's obviously not as big as a framework as, uh, or, or tool as Rails because you know Rails offers a lot more. But for Webpack's purpose, um, you're taking that SAS again and you're, you're, you're building an extension that allows uh, Webpack to understand, interpret, compile, deliver SAS. So, with this and said, like Webpack's super hard to classify. Um, it might seem like it's a compiler. Uh, and in many cases it is, but if you also look at it, it kind of feels like something else entirely because compilers are somewhat definitive in nature, right? If you have a bunch of compilers that are totally different and mean totally different things or a totally different makeup, you really don't have a standard of compilation. You just have a bunch of different compilers that do different stuff. So, I think what I've found is that Webpack not only compiles your code in some way, but also optimizes it. And that's the whole pitch of it, right? Like you, every, every tool, like a, a JSX or something like that, might have um, some kind of hand-built thing that will compile it uh, and give it in, into interpretable JS. But what Webpack does is it takes all that code and it compiles and optimizes it for, uh, for again, for browser delivery. So I would say the pitches of Webpack is that it's the extendable compiler. So what you're able to do with extendable Webpack that I think is super interesting is that you're, you know, again, we have that baseline of Webpack only really understanding JavaScript. But we create loaders to help teach Webpack how to compile more complex languages and configurations. Uh, these plugins help compress, minify, and manipulate existing bundles. So again, we're, we're taking that base functionality and we're extending it beyond to what actually the community's needs are. 
So the end goal of this code is optimized for browser execution. Uh, so that's the kind of run on, on the Webpacker primer. So we're gonna just pretend for a second that maybe we're, sold, we're all sold. You thought like that was the greatest sales pitch ever um, and you're totally convinced that Webpack is gonna be the usage for all your apps ever, forever, and always. Um, why directly integrate in the Rails? And this, this is what the whole kind of talk leans on, is that uh, Webpack is an effective tool right now outside of Rails. It, you know, it's just another thing that you're running. So if you wanna use Webpacker with your JavaScript or maybe a gem might have an implementation where it brings Webpacker, uh, Webpack support into uh, Rails, like why would, why would you embrace something like Webpacker? And so I think part of this comes off as a pitch for using the Webpacker gem and there's some great people building it. Um, I've only really written documentation to help understand and, and communicate that message for folks, but um, what I think that I see with it is this uh, from the overall like Rails as a, as a full story point of view is that we're starting to really embrace these tools and kind of have a means for people of the jobs or community to kind of come in and get to know Rails better. Um, so we're gonna kind of run over that kind of stuff and see what, what's good there. So this all boils down to the asset pipeline. Um, odds are most people use the asset pipeline. I've used it pretty much in most of the things that I've done. Um, I'm sure I, if you don't use it, I would love to hear your implementation. I'm sure it's super interesting. But um, the asset pipeline, from what I know, because I started at Rails 4.0, uh, was that we kind of introduced the idea in Rails Comp 2011 around Rails 3.1. And it was really a solution to saying, all right, I have all this scattered JavaScript, CSS, front-end type languages, and I want a better way to support that. Uh, I want a better way to organize that, and I want a better way for that to, um, you know, become more rail, better into that Rails workflow. Um, and really, again, the, the reasoning behind it is organizing JavaScript, but also supporting new languages via gem interfaces, which I thought was super interesting, but I, I, I kind of forgot about because, again, I took it for granted. I was like, oh, there's just a SAS Rails gem, or there's a, um, you know, your, your HAML, or any, any other kind of extension you might use. And so it was really a, a way to easily embrace whatever new language idea um, thing that you want to implement in your app, and uh, also integrate those into the Rails workflow. So it set us up as a community for this ability to really support whatever else was new without having to say, all right, well, you know, the, the wizards at the top of the mountain of Rails have decided that uh, you can only use these three languages or things. And so that was really exciting, I think, for the community. So the, if you go uh, kind of do some research and, and digging on the asset pipeline, it's really based around three ideas of concatenation, minification, and pre-processing of all that stuff you dump into it. And from a, just a practical point of view, and this is pretty simple if you've understood uh, kind of how compilation works and breaking that down, right, is that we're taking uh, a SAS, for example, uh, we're breaking that down to CSS, and then maybe we're gonna run it through the asset pipeline or anything else that we might do, any kind of compressors, uh, and we're getting our quote unquote optimized CSS. Um, this allows for us to write that abstract code in SAS, uh, but it, have it also directly compile to uh, CSS and automatically be inserted into the asset pipeline for optimization. Again, a very huge oversimplification of the great work that people have done with gems over the years, uh, but I think that uh, it, it's, it's about, I wanna talk about the heart <laughs> behind everything here. So this all sounds really, really, really familiar to Webpack, and that's because it kinda is. Um, we take you know, a thing like rake assets precompile, where we're taking all our JavaScript, our CSS, all our stuff, and we're compiling it the stuff that is optimized for delivery and for consumption. And we a lot of times maybe do that in our production settings. Uh, if you're learning Rails, you've probably done what I've done, where I just hammer rake assets precompile a bunch with a production flag, and it eventually works on my servers. That's kind of how I learned to deploy, because um, I went to school and ignored everything that was told to me. So um, anyways, uh, these ideas are really, really similar to Webpack. Um, and I see Webpacker, or Webpack, uh, and the Asset Pipeline are two similar tools used by completely different communities, right? Like, Rails has always had the Asset Pipeline uh, for a while, not always, but since, you know, Rails 3.1, they've, they've had the Asset Pipeline to kind of help us deal with that. Um, with the JavaScript community, they've had various solutions, but Webpack is the most, by most, the pop, one of the most popular ones right now. So, uh, 
And it's also interesting because in recent years, if you noticed, Rails JavaScript and non-Rails JavaScript have started to look pretty similar. Um, you have some companies that are maybe doing uh, what people might consider more Rails-flavored JavaScript. You know, a lot of the community embrace CoffeeScript, a lot of those ideas, uh, and still do, and, and they're great, and making some awesome stuff with that. But there's a really, there's a need again, because there, there's a need to kind of incorporate those workflows, because more people are starting to use stuff like React, or Angular, or any sort of other kind of framework in their, uh, in their apps. So again, here's another crudely drawn uh, graph reviewing pleasure, but uh, you have a, with Webpack, right, you have a bunch of JS code, uh, or CSS, or anything else like that, you're passing through Webpack, and you get static assets. Uh, with asset pipeline, you have a very similar thing. You're taking your files, you're passing it through the pipeline, and you're getting easily a JS manifest and a CS man, CSS manifest. If you break down the browser, which I wish I'd inserted an image of that, um, but you know, you just see your application.css and your JavaScript.css, that little digest. So if we just think about it from the perspective of input and output, right, we're really doing the same thing. We're taking our code that we want to have compiled and shoved into a browser, make optimized our browser, and we're uh, having it run through our tool of choice. So it might seem weird uh, that we're kind of wanting to integrate them together or have them work together because they have kind of similar approaches and there might be a worry, right, that they're overlapping each other or that they're really fighting against each other. In some ways they are. But the heart and the approach of saying, okay, I have this stuff and I want to process it, I think what Webpacker allows to do uh, is for Rails to process more modern JavaScript quicker in a, in a way that that community processes it, right? The Rails community may approach JavaScript one way, um, but JavaScript as a whole, like in, with their community, might have another approach to it. So uh, again, why do we need a uh, Webpacker rail gem for Rails? Uh, why not just use Webpack by itself? Um, and I want to give a few reasons here. Uh, one of the biggest things that I see is for the sake of having a consistent option for those who use Webpack. Um, we talk a lot about making Rails more accessible, and I think GHH kind of mentioned a little bit this morning, right, is like we still want to have those same attitudes. We want to be able to bring people, uh, kind of have people, give people an easy way to worry about the stuff that actually matters and not necessarily be overburdened by like, well, I use Webpack, but it's really a pain in the butt to, to configure for Rails or to embrace that, right? Um, I think that Rails thrives on consistency, and having a community-supported option for Webpack helps out smooth out any differences in implementations we might find. If you really dig beneath a lot of your gems that are maybe taking your, uh, your frameworks and, and maybe importing it into Rails, uh, oftentimes you might find that you have some wonderful implementations by some really, really smart people, but you know, it, sometimes it comes down to a, a game of numbers. When I have 15 people working together on a, a solution, uh, they're going to think they're not going to see things that maybe 200 people working on a solution might see. So I think what I see out of all this is you have a better, faster, and stronger support for front-end languages that don't require a gem library to be supported. And there's little to there's ideally there should be little and no translation required for uh, existing Webpack projects to uh, live in Rails or Web. Uh, and so the heart behind that, right, is that we want to make that transition easy. And that's forever gonna be the bane of any gym, right? Is that, well, we've designed it for these ways for you to import, but I've got this super special way that you haven't designed for yet. But the goal is to kind of increase that canopy of uh, kind of accessibility over, across the whole community. Um, and finally, it's about making Rails more accessible to those who love Webpack. Um, I think what we find, and this is what I found at least uh, with my uh, small bit of experience, is that you have a lot, a lot of people programming JavaScript these days, uh, and only JavaScript. Uh, if we could show surveys or, or whatever we want to do to prove that, but the point is a lot of people are just programming only JavaScript these days. Whereas that JavaScript seemed like for a while, uh, it, it definitely my experience was like a, oh, I guess I'll do this, it's kind of annoying, like I kind of just wish I could do this with the back end language. And so, a lot of times, there are JavaScript developers who are looking for a backend, uh, especially with services like your, your Firebase or anything else like that, that that provides you a means to have a backend API and just pay for it. 
there eventually becomes a point where there's actually just companies out there that are running completely off front end JavaScript and maybe a serverless back end solution. So the question is, what kind of framework are they gonna choose? What kind of developers are they gonna hire when they decide, hey, we've got a couple million dollars in the bank, we wanna hire a back end team. So, uh, and I think the other part of it is encouraging existing Rails users to have easy access getting started with Webpack. If I'm being honest, I'm, I don't feel like an like a old man yelling on the cloud, but there are times where I felt or seen stuff in the JavaScript community that's come apart. Like I thought like React was super dumb for a really long time, I'll, I'll admit that, I should probably should buy a shirt, right? But like I was like, I don't understand why you need this, like this is ridiculous and uh, this is pr programming stupid, I, I quit, right? But the, the thing is, is that we eventually, if, if the idea is good enough, it usually tends to stick around. And it usually, there's, there comes a point where as developers we have to confront that idea. And I think that uh, giving people older and newer to programming uh, a means to easily access those new ideas and not necessarily worry about the configuration, <coughs> excuse me, because that was such the bane for so long, right? If you ask any JavaScript developer, they'd be like, oh man, I just hate configuring Webpack, it's so ridiculous, it's like a waste of my time, it's all I do. And so when I hear that, I'm like, I don't wanna code front end framework, I don't wanna like do what you're doing, man, because I use Rails and I don't have to worry about that as much, and like why would I do that? So I think the hope and the heart behind the whole thing is saying, you know, what if we had the means uh, for us to come and just jump into coding React? as opposed to configuring something to start coding React because then we get frustrated, we throw up our arms and say, I'm not gonna do this anymore, right? Um, and there's a lot of emphasis and in, in, um, in interest in Webpack uh, is based around buy into those new ideas, right? So for those who are bought into uh, Webpack, we want an easier way for them to buy into Rails. For those who are bought into Rails, we want an easier way for them to buy into Webpack. So we wanna kind of bought, have things go both ways. Um, and so now here's my favorite slide because it makes people kind of knee jerk react real quick, is we're gonna talk about Turbolinks for a second. And it's actually not gonna be about trashing Turbolinks. Uh, so sorry if you're looking for a good old like tur Turbolinks roast, it's not happening today. But um, Turbolinks has been a project uh, that's been really, uh, really well for some folks. And uh, it hasn't really been cared for by others. It's been kind of the one thing that people are really salty about strangely and that's fine, right? Like, if you use Turbolinks, you're probably making cool stuff in Turbolinks, and that's maybe good, right? It's better than just having something and be like, I don't know why I have this in my project, but it's here, right? So I think it's totally okay that some ideas don't necessarily stick. Um, but the problem with introducing an idea like Turbolinks, right, is that you have to introduce a new idea, say, hey, I've been making this, which is usually how a lot of that stuff in Rails comes, right? It's like, hey, our awesome company has been doing this cool thing, this is the extraction that we're taking out or calling it whatever. But the other half of it is you have to also sell it to others, right? You have to convince people, hey, this is a good idea and this is why you should use it. Um, the problem is both these things are incredibly hard uh, and they don't always stick. Uh, and today we've got stimulus. Uh, if you've heard about it, it's kind of a new front end framework thing by Basecamp guys and girls and it's pretty cool. Um, but it's probably gonna be the same stuff. Again, you have to introduce that new idea, like hey, we're jumping into the front end framework game, here's why our solution uh, is working for us and making cool stuff, uh, or we're making cool stuff with it. Um, but also, uh, you know, they have to sell it. And, and that's totally normal, because again, like it's cool to have solutions that work for some people and maybe just don't work for others, but at least you have the option to opt in, opt out. Excuse me. So, um, Webpacker integration via Webpacker is special because it's taking something that's already been so successful in a community and giving it a means to bind with Rails. And what I think is really exciting about that is that a lot less selling is required with this whole pitch, right? You're probably here because you've heard about Webpack and you're looking for like a, what is a Webpack? Or maybe looking for a tutorial or a deep dive or whatever. There's a workshop later in the week if you're interested that's kind of dealing with a really like, let's just go and just get down to the core of Webpacker. But the point being from my perspective is a lot less selling is required for that. But this does bring up some architectural concerns and I do like to talk about architecture because that's what I did last year and it was a lot of fun. Um, instead of being separate things uh, that are more microservice like you're moving to monolithic territory 
And this is not a bad thing, right? In Rails, we talk about the majestic monolith. A lot of people are bought into that. Maybe people write their blog post about it and they get really excited and get as much collapse on Medium, right? Um, that's cool. And again, that works for some people. But I kind of proposed this idea last year and I'm kind of going to keep running with it until uh, either fails miserably, so please tell me if it's an awful idea. But it, it's the idea of the mighty microservice ecosystem. And what I mean by this is that uh, when we see the development of how Rails is going, it oftentimes feels like an ecosystem of microservices that are all being orchestrated together, right? You have your active record, you have maybe a view layer, you have uh, some middleware, but they're all kind of becoming increasingly, as we, as we refine each piece of Rails more and more, we're seeing that sections of Rails are becoming more, uh, they, they almost function like smaller microservices. You can take it, they're more modular. You can replace them with something else if you want at certain points, right? And so uh, the, the whole value that I see of this is that we're able to really come through and um, have this means of, you know, it, it's, I don't know if you've ever worked with microservices before. Actually, quick poll, who here works in microservices? Like, you got like more than five microservices running around, right? Cool, so it's like sizable amount of people. Uh, everybody else is in a monolith, I assume, is that kind of the, the vibe, maybe? Yeah, no code, maybe, no, yeah. Um, so yeah, so a lot of times we're using one of the T, right? But the cool part about it is that the, the trouble I've found with microservices is, is that uh, they're just really annoying to have like five code windows open if you're trying to make a change, right? Like, and, and, and you technically have more smaller, more refined code. Something, uh, idea that is maybe uh, hopefully clean and hopefully makes sense and concise and you understand how it interacts with their services. But the kind of beauty of Rails and the, the whole proposition, this whole thing, it says like, what if you could not have to run a Webpack server and configure something separately and then hope it passes it to the Rails system, which hopes the Rails catches it, interprets it, and delivers the way you want. Like maybe you have a, another front end service that you're actually delivering the view layer through. You know, it's, it, it can get crazy. And I think what Rails is kind of navigating towards, which I think is really exciting for me as a developer, and um, I'm kind of hoping that there's more and more options like this for me and the teams that I work with, but also uh, for maybe you and your teams, is that um, we're able to have this just kind of one home for all this code. <laughs> It, you know, we're kind of swinging back into more monolithic territory for microservices. And I think that's kind of funny, but at the same time, I think it's a proposition that Webpacker is making. Um, and so this actually brings me to one of the more interesting parts of the talk. Uh, and it's kind of the end of it, but it's, we're talking about, for me, with non-Webpack citizens, right? Um, because not everybody in this whole wide, beautiful world supports um, Webpack, right? It all makes sense if you use something that uses Webpack. Or even if you're just wanting to get started in a smaller, more module-based JavaScript, right? Like, it's not like you have to say, like, oh, I, I'm only gonna use Webpack for this, right? It'll take anything that you, you can configure it to interpret whatever you want. But uh, there are existing framework solutions out there that aren't Webpack friendly. So what about those people? Uh, does it mean that Rails is only supporting, uh, for, in a first-class manner, Webpack friendly frameworks? It might seem like that's the case. Um, but the big twist of all this whole thing is that IDEA actually uses Ember.js. And so that's actually my day job, is dealing this stuff. So it might seem completely silly and stupid that I did a talk on Webpack, and maybe that's the great risk of my career, is that I do really stupid things for like no reason, because it's snowing, and I'm in, I'm, I live in Orlando, so like this is not, not really cool right now for me. But um, the, the point that I see about all this and I'm actually encouraged by the development of Webpacker, and, I'm, and, and that's why it led me to be really interested and spend a lot of time really wrestling with why. Why are people choosing this? Why does this matter? Why is this actually beneficial to Rails? Um, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, I would love a solution uh, that would be something similar. Ember uses broccoli. But let's say that another um, great framework community comes up tomorrow and they say, hey, we're using whatever ridiculous compiler or thing or whatever makes sense to them, right? Because um, as we've learned, right, you look at Rails Comp 2011, <laughs> people are like, oh man, we're using jQuery now. We're like totally modern. We have got it figured out. We're gonna stay with jQuery for forever. We're just, ne it's never gonna end. And then, you know, now everybody's dropping jQuery in their frameworks. 
And that's totally fine, but again, even the best or most popular supported community things have a life cycle. Webpacker ultimately has a life cycle, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, but the, the thought of it to me is the fact that, okay, we're, um, we're, we're taking something that really, has a really big community support that has a lot of love out there, and we're uh, giving it the ability to really uh, you know, come into the Rails community in a, in, a, in a way that makes sense. And so for me, it's hoping that if, if Webpacker has more and more success, and it already has had a considerable amount of success, right, because lots of people are coding React or Angular, those are two really big language, two big frameworks a lot of people have been using with it. Um, my hope is that maybe we can start to start thinking about options for other um, supported platforms because personally I'm a bit tired of having to manage my own custom shotgun <laughs> solution to uh, making a, a, a thing work. And I think that's one of the things that um, I kind of glazed over earlier that I do want to come back and talk about real quick is the idea, right, of, and the whole utility of this, of having a Webpack or Gem or using Webpack is saying that uh, if you've ever looked into how you sometimes bind your favorite uh, framework or idea uh, to Rails, Oftentimes it can feel kind of limiting or depending on how refined that solution is, right? You may not have the best experience. You may find yourself like running a bunch of servers and not really knowing about it, right? Or having to really dive deep into a bug that you don't quite understand. And I think so Webpacker kind of exposes that configuration aspect for us and so that we're not trusting uh, just a kind of hard-coded set of defaults by another um, person. But that's the whole talk I've got. Um, thank you for coming out, and thank you for listening to me kind of uh, try to share what I have uh, kind of been just diving through and trying to wrestle with the webpack. If you got any questions, uh, please come talk to me afterwards. I've actually got to catch a flight out of here uh, pretty soon because of personal and work reasons, but uh, if not, I'd love to keep in contact with you somehow. So thank you guys very, very much.